Hey everyone, Rizzo here. And before we get into the video proper, I'd like to issue a quick little disclaimer. I was invited out to Sledgehammer Games' studio back in mid-June to play this map early. I know early access events are a big point of contention in the community, so I figured I'd just get that out of the way right up front. And with the air cleared, let's get into the video. Before we walk the tortured path, I'd like to, as always, go over what's happened in the downtime since the release of the Shattered Throne. And, just like always, if you'd like to skip to my thoughts on the map itself, just go to the on-screen timestamp. With that out of the way, let's recap. Like the time between DLC 1 and 2, a lot has happened in the world of World War II zombies since the release of the Shadow Throne. Regardless of what internet comments would have you believe, the orders and contracts have been slightly retooled and now offer zombies consumable drops in addition to the standard credits and supply drop rewards. A jack-in-the-box guarantee consumable has been added. I personally never got one though. The pack-a-punch delay has almost been entirely removed. Previously, there was a very noticeable delay between the time the pack-a-punch sound finished and being able to actually pick up your weapon. Now, as soon as that sound finishes, you can pick up your weapon. The Blitz purchase times have been adjusted. Your first purchase will still be rather slow, but after that, you completely skip the extra handshake part and get right back into the action. This is something that has been a long time coming, but it's good to see it finally here regardless. With the Liberty Strike event, special contracts were available that allowed you to unlock Moonraven variants of the Mountaineer, Survivalist, Hunter, Slayer, and Not the Bat. Eight new weapons have been added to the Mystery Box's global rotation. The Nambu Type 2, the fan favorite PTRS-41, Stinger LMG, Blunderbuss, Lever Action, the ZK-383 SMG, the AVS-36 Assault Rifle, and lastly, the Delio Sniper Rifle. But these weapons aren't without issue. The PTRS and the lever action both lack snap aim, and only receive aim assist when you hold your breath. Only problem is, you can't hold your breath in zombies for some reason. So for console players, this makes the weapon significantly harder to use than it should be. Especially when the other sniper rifles get the snap aim function. PC players are totally fine though. The final, yet easily most important thing, well, to me at least, all the extra lore and world building. For starters, we finally got confirmation that Bat Agent and Elite are actually Vivian Harris from the campaign and Major Rideau, respectively. Where'd that happen? Well, turns out you can just ask Cameron things on Twitter and he'll be like, Yeah, I won't lie, I personally always thought it was just lazy asset reuse, and who knows? It might have originally been that, but then someone said, Okay, but what if we do this? Alright, back up a second, Rizzo. Who the hell's Vivian and why does that matter? Oh, right, I forgot that no one actually plays campaign. Maybe they'd be better off just removing it from the next one. Oh, wait. Anyway, she's an SOE operative that made a minor appearance in the first act of World War II's campaign. Continuing with the out-of-game lore, the Drosten files and the community updates have been replaced by letters from the Bureau of Archaic Technologies, written from either the perspective of Rideau or Vivian. Much like Marie's journal entries, none of the information in these letters is essential to understanding the game's overall story, unlike the timeline. But for those who like doing the extra homework, it's a nice little bonus, although I completely understand why people don't like this kind of stuff and just want it all to be in-game. The Attack of the Undead event officially tied the multiplayer universe into the zombie story as well. So that means that campaign, zombies, and multiplayer are, in some ways, all tied together. Canonically, Attack of the Undead takes place between the Shadowed Throne and the Tortured Path, and with Sledgehammer's way of letting us experience a spread of Straub's Reich across Europe firsthand. I know this is all oddly specific to harp on, but I love canonic crossovers and supplemental material like this that enriches the lore. It's one of the reasons I... <sighs> kinda like the 343 era of Halo. Aside from what's already in the game, multiple upcoming changes have been publicly revealed. There's the weapon variant perk rework and special contracts, but more importantly, during a playthrough of The Tortured Path on IGN, Cameron revealed that they're finally going to be tuning whistlings. It hasn't been revealed exactly what they're going to do, but judging by the conversation, if I had to guess, it'll likely have to do with the spawn rates and perhaps even a spawn cap. I personally really hope it's the latter, because as funny as it is to hoard a crowd of clubmen, from an artistic and lore standpoint, it's kind of silly. Also gameplay. Yeah, it sucks from a gameplay stance that this can even happen. Alright, turns out I was right and they're gonna be globally tuning the whistling spawn rates. Okay, back to the video. Now, with all the changes discussed, we're finally caught up to the present day. So I'd say it's about time we finally started walking the tortured path. Never getting tired of that joke.
As always, I'd like to start with what I enjoyed about this DLC, so that when I get into the bad stuff, it'll make my complaint seem legitimate because I looked at the game from both angles. Too transparent? Yeah, probably. Easily the most impressive thing about this DLC is how rich its world building and story is. Set several months after the events of the Shadowed Throne, Straub's undead forces have ravaged across Europe, with Nazi propaganda painting it as, to quote Rideau, a brilliant attempt by the Fuhrer to call upon the lost sons of this final Reich to defend the fatherland. Truth of the matter is, both sides are suffering heavy losses, as the Nazi Schaefers have had little luck controlling the undead forces. In response, President Truman authorized the creation of the Bureau of Archaic Technologies, and members of the Manhattan Project were tasked with reverse engineering captured electrosnow devices. Over the next few months, the Bureau would attempt to reforge the sword and strategically strike key military points in the Nazi regime, until learning of an operation created by Adolf Hitler in response to Operation High Jump to find Thule. This then leads Rideau to task Marie, Drosten, Jefferson, Olivia, the Mountaineer, and the Smuggler with journeying to New Swabia for answers regarding the sword, much to the dismay of Vivian as the Allied forces are already spread far too thin for such a mission. All of this story happens before the first cutscene. Told you there was a lot here. I'm not going to recap the entire story in this video, because A, there is a lot here to talk about, and B, Reed actually made a really good video explaining just about everything, so there will be a link to his video in the description if you're interested in learning more. Seriously though, it's a really good video. Go check it out if you haven't already. Still on the topic of story, I want to talk about Across the Depths' weirdo acid trip. After filling some Uber Schnell batteries, we're teleported to... Okay, I have no idea what this is. Here, we see relics of the previous maps and get a couple cameo appearances from Dr. Straub. As awesome and trippy as all this weirdness is, I have one question about it. How are these characters even seeing this stuff? In Chapter 2, we play as the Bureau operatives, and the Bureau recruits were never present to see these events for themselves. They didn't hear Straub say anything about catching Klaus, firebombing Middleburg, or see his demise in Berlin. I don't know if there's something going on with the Geistcraft and Barbarossa or manipulation or whatever. Or who knows, maybe it's just an oversight by the writers. Everyone gets one. The characterization of the Bureau Operatives and Jefferson Potts. While the stuff for the Bureau Operatives is admittedly a bit simple, it's nice to finally have names and basic personalities for all these neat little side characters we've been seeing since launch. Of course, Rideau and Vivian are the strongest of the lot, simply because we've already seen and interacted with these characters before in different parts of the game. I just really hope we haven't seen the last of them and they get even more development next time. Hell, I'd be fine if they didn't even do it in-game and they just gave us some character bios in the community updates like ExoZombies. Wink wink. As for Jefferson, he's the one that gets the spotlight in Beneath the Ice, and we finally get to learn a bit more about him. We get to learn about his past and what made him into the man he is today, along with some borderline uncomfortable dialogue. You got an issue with authority? I'm a black man from the ass end of Arkansas, Professor. What do you think authority has usually meant to me? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck! Oh shit! I wasn't <laughs> ready for that! Now that we're through the story and the characters, let's get into what I liked about the gameplay. The addition of Richter's, quote unquote, greatest achievement, the Waffen Boxes. Or maybe it's Waffen Boxes. I don't know. I love the random element they bring to gameplay. As much as I like being able to get exactly what I want, there's a certain satisfaction that comes with rolling the dice and hitting it big. I have a gambling problem. The Rocketin Brenner and Guardian boss fights. Both of these bosses are well executed and fun to fight. The Geistcraft shield of the Rocketin Brenner requires the player to lure him to missile strikes around the play space to temporarily break it. And while the Guardian may not be shielded, he's something you always have to keep an eye on. After taking enough damage, he'll retreat to the center of the map and attempt to heal himself. So you'll need to stay vigilant throughout the entire fight. The Stott Jaeger, on the other hand, is... Boring as sin. Literally no strategy is involved whatsoever. You just shoot it until it kills itself. It's a bit disappointing. The objective variety and overall balance of set objectives. The biggest change up to this DLC's formula is the addition of objective rounds similar to the ones found in ExoZombies. On rounds 3, 6, and 9, you have to complete a random objective to progress. This can range from shooting down a Zeppelin prototype, defeating a horde of Moishlas, defending a power supply, assassinating a VIZ, repairing radios, disarming bombs, etc. There's a very healthy amount of objectives to keep the game fresh and to keep you on your toes. 
Not all of them are created equal, however, but we'll get to that later. So here's the question I bet some of you are rightfully asking. Why do you find the objective rounds to be fun here when you are so against their inclusion in Exozombies? Well, it's because I feel like those rounds impeded on standard gameplay and were not balanced to fit with the pace of the game. For example, as early as Wave... 6, I think? You'd have to escort a brain-dead survivor across the entire map while vicious hordes of zombies rain down on your position. If you didn't have full contact grenades, distraction drones, and a fair bit of luck on your side, you were very likely to fail, which in turn would shut down all power across the map. Or how about the bomb defusal on Carrier? Fight a ton of special zombies, scramble to reach the bomb in time, only to have to face off against Atlas strike teams armed to the teeth. Oh, and did I mention that the zombies will completely ignore them? The Tortured Path, on the other hand, is built with these objectives in mind, and the player has far more tools at their disposal to assist them. Do you need to defend an objective? Pop Frontline to lure them away. Have a horde of Mice to Moishlas on your tail early on? Free Fire with a Mark II mod will make short work of them. But that also brings up a problem. Because of how unpredictable the objectives can be, if you want to play efficiently, you don't have all that much wiggle room as a solo player. I've tried so many loadouts, but there's only one or two that pretty much guarantee success. In co-op, as always, you have a lot more freedom, but once again, solo players kind of get the shaft. Once you reach max bureau rank, you'll gain access to the darkened path. This is essentially the game's hard mode. It increases zombie health, speed, spawn numbers, boss health, and ups the special zombie spawn rate to ludicrous levels. Personally, this isn't exactly my cup of tea, primarily because I'm admittedly not good enough to complete it, but I do appreciate the addition nonetheless. Now it's time to list off the little things that, while they may not be game-changing, they help make the experience just a little bit better. Each map has a unique Pack-a-Punch camo. I guarantee Milo really appreciated this one. The FOV and gun position when you're affected by Geistcraft looks really good. Maybe make it a toggleable option in the graphics menu? The Mountaineer's fur physics in the cutscenes. I'm 99% sure he was the one picked to accompany our heroes simply because an animator wanted to show off. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's three brand new special unlockable characters for the hardcore crowd. The Cavalier, Lady Death, and the Iron Tiger. Upon completion of each map's easter egg, you'll be rewarded with a new camo for use in weapon kits. Verdot now dons his elite uniform in the zombie supply tab and the headquarters. Our main four actually changed their outfits to better suit their environment. I don't think that's literally ever happened before. By the way, Richtofen on Ascension doesn't count. That's just weird and confusing. Klaus makes a cameo appearance in Chapter 3. While his appearance doesn't seem to have any major story implications yet, it's nice to see an old face again even if he is just a spooky specter. So that's everything I liked about the Tortured Path. Sounds like quite a bit, right? Well, that's because it is. But like every map, there's some things I didn't like so much. So without further delay, let's get into the bad. Let's start from the beginning. The intro cutscene is completely disconnected from the actual game. The cutscene ends with a shot of our crew journeying to Thule to fight zombies and reforge Barbarossa's sword. But then we jump, very suddenly and without proper transition, to the middle of a rundown village in Spain. We must utterly destroy them. I didn't edit this at all by the way, this is actually how it transitions in real time. It would have made more sense for the cutscene to do that thing that the Modern Warfare games did, where it zooms out to an overhead view of the world, it can move from Thule to Spain, and then zoom in down on Rideau and Co, transitioning into the gameplay. I feel that, along with a bit more voiceover, this would have helped with the immediate disconnect most players likely felt upon booting up the map. The outro cutscene also has pacing issues, but not to the extent of the intro. As Drossin's rambling on, the camera zooms out to reveal that there's massive amounts of Geistcraft energy underneath Thule, which is a neat little tease that something big's coming, but the pacing of this reveal is completely fucked. Instead of giving the scene time to breathe, it, again, cuts very abruptly. It's kinda hard to explain, so I'll just let it play out. Hey! How is it that you're up to your arse in undead ghoulies and still have enough sense to translate the prehistoric scribbles of a lost race? If I had to guess, these issues likely stemmed from budgetary and time constraints as opposed to genuine creative decisions doesn't make the complaints any less valid though. This is something I've been having a problem with for a while, but the tonal shift. It's even more of a contrast to the earlier maps than the Shadow Throne was. The Final Reich and the Darkest Shore were focused on building up an atmosphere of dread and terror, whereas the Shadowed Throne and the Tortured Path are, well, 
The best comparative I can draw is the Indiana Jones films. Those films are classic adventure films with occasionally scary or fantastical elements that a full-fledged horror movie. Now, I love the Indiana Jones films. Well, two of them. So why is this a problem? Well, it all comes down to execution and a bigger picture. While the tone of each individual map is very well executed, the transition of tone between the maps and how it all fits together was very sudden and poorly handled in my opinion. If it was more of a gradual change, I wouldn't have too much of an issue with it. But as it stands, it feels like a game mode tonally at odds with itself. A similar comparative I could draw is the sudden shift in the Aether storyline when Jason Blundell officially took over, but nowhere near as extreme. For context, if you haven't really played Treyarch Zombies since, like, Black Ops 1, the Zelensky era maps had some dark background elements, but were largely cheesy, fun little zombies adventures, whereas the Origin Saga is a much darker, significantly more depressing take on the zombies lore, where themes of regret, facing your mortality, coming to grips with living a lie, loss of loved ones, and the fear of death take center stage. You know, when you put it like that, the Blondo era is a wee bit unpleasant. And that's precisely why I dig it so much. This isn't a debate on which era is better by the way. I know there's fans of both, and they both have their merits. Now back to World War II. Peter Straub's absence is felt. I know that it's certainly better for the tone of the story for him to stay dead, but with the exception of an apparition in Chapter 2, he makes no appearance, which would be fine on its own, but nothing compelling takes his place. There's no actual villain in this chapter of the saga, just zombies and the Germans, which aren't nearly as interesting as Straub and Richter were. Aside from the couple of issues I had with the tone and story, I have some issues with the things that actually matter to the internet. Gameplay. While I've praised the gameplay of the tortured path thus far, I'd be lying if I said it was perfect. Let's get into it. Defense slash escort rounds and solo. I hate everything about these. Because of how strong and frequent the zombies are, it's nearly impossible to defend your objective normally. So unless you have full jacks and or frontline, you may as well just restart. Special enemy spawn rates in Chapter 2 are... a bit much for how CQC the corridors are. Especially with how broken bombers are. Let's get a bit technical for a minute here. The way a bomber's proximity fuse works is that if it's close enough to a player, it starts a timer until detonation, and will explode as long as the player stays close enough. Sounds all fine and dandy, right? Well, there's a problem with this. The way it's programmed at the moment, their fuse can be set through geometry and while they're spawning in, and since their spawn-in and traversal animations don't have a warning note track like the sprint animation does, that timer can be set and you would have no idea since the sound doesn't play. So if you've ever had a bomber just instantly explodes as it traverses a barrier or spawns in and across the depths, or any map really, now you know why. This is a massive problem that needs to be fixed. Speaking of bombers, they no longer die when their payload detonates. Like, why? Throwing knives and ripsaw charges no longer one-hit kill bombers past a certain point. Again, what is the point of this? It feels like a way to artificially inflate the game's difficulty. Aha, you're used to certain mechanics working a certain way, but they no longer work that way, so that equals... difficulty? Yeah, let's go with that. For Chapter 1's Easter Egg, you need to build a zombie. Oh no, not again. I wanted to save this for last since it's the one I feel the most strong about, but the way the map quests and survival unlocks were handled. People occasionally say that I give World War II far too much of a pass. That's understandable. If you really like something, you're a lot more likely to let the smaller things off the hook because of how much you enjoy the product overall. Back to what we were talking about. The idea of a cross-map quest journey is awesome, but it all comes down to execution, and the execution this time is not good. The quests on their own are rather banal and simple due to each map being limited to 10 rounds of gameplay, but to fully complete the quest and get the cutscene, you need to do all three quests in a single sitting, and if you fail any of them, for any reason, you're back to square one. Like, who is this for? Honestly. Casual players, and by that I mean the ones that just play the game and don't really care about the easter egg quests, kinda like me, those people are never going to do this. Which means that they would have never unlocked the survival maps normally. Which means, if they didn't like the new twist on the mode and just wanted to play classic zombies, there was literally nothing for them in this DLC. Now that we're through the things I didn't like, it's time for my favorite part. 
the smaller things and nitpicks. Oh man, if there's one thing I love in this world, it's being a nitpicky goof and pointing out things that literally nobody but me cares about. When the Stardiaker spawns in, he'll temporarily eye pose and then swing down from an invisible beam. I know this is because he's reusing his intro animation from the Shadowed Throne, but it's still super distracting. The Ripsaw is missing sounds again, but this time it's not the execution sounds, it's the charging sound. And this error also allows the player to charge forever. Right. Yet again, no new bat variants. When the Stadiegger dies, his death animation counts against the in-game timer, which makes getting the challenge for beating him in under 30 seconds much more difficult than it should be. When opening a zombie's consumable crate, the cards can be seen floating in the bottom of the crate. This doesn't happen with any other type of supply drop. Seriously, we get even more variants of these idiots, but not the bats? When Straub walks away laughing in the apparition, his cloth physics aren't active and his leg clips directly through his lab coat. This is the only animation of his in the entire game where this happens. You must have a new now built into his chassis. It's like a bloody power plant. Oh really? Well, then why is the model completely unchanged? The filament material on the Meister Moishla's Electro Schnells don't have a color specified. All Moishlas use their censored Japanese materials where the gore is blacked out. This happens on the darkest shore as well, and I have no idea why. Emissive materials don't apply properly to the AVS-36. When loading into a co-op game of Beneath the Ice, all player models use a placeholder until the game loads properly. Whether or not that's just because I'm on a standard PS4, who knows. This one is more of a universal issue that I've never mentioned before, but since I know some of the people with Sledgehammer watch these, I figured I'd bring it up, and who knows, maybe like Livia's scarf, it'll get changed someday. Vivian's head uses the wrong eye material. In Zombies, Vivian uses the standard brown eye material, whereas in the campaign, her eye is a more accurate hazel. Wow, Rizzo, how'd you notice that? I... I cheated and looked at the material names on the model exports. Now usually, we'd be done by now, but this DLC has even more content than usual, and that content comes in the form of survival maps. Let's talk about them real quick. There's three separate survival experiences, Bodega Cervantes, USS Mount Olympus, and Altar of Blood. Unlike Grossenhaus to Prologue, these maps actually have quite a few changes when compared to their Tortured Path counterparts. For example, Richter's Waffen boxes have been replaced with standard wall buys and all Wonder Weapons, barring the Wonder Bus, are available directly from the Mystery Box. A Brenner will also show up every 10 waves on Bodega and Altar. Demont. RP. But the most surprising change of all, Whistlings are completely absent from Mount Olympus. I gotta say, this is arguably the best decision that could have possibly been made, as the map's design is far too close quarters to properly accommodate them. I know how much you love the Whistling Sledgehammer, but if they were on the survival variant of this map, I and many others would probably not be happy, to put it lightly. Let's start with what I liked about the survival maps, and then we'll move on to what I didn't care for. Each of the survival maps offers a very different style of play. Bodega Cervantes is a much more open and easy to relax in map. Mount Olympus is extremely close quarters and keeps you constantly on your toes. And Altar of Blood provides a nice mix of the two. Each map's box rotation also features the Tesla gun, ripsaw, ice pick, baseball bat, and the trench knife. And after a small easter egg, all of them can be upgraded. You remember how much I said I love the melee weapons of the Shadow Throne? So you can imagine that this immediately elevated all these maps a bit in my book. Even more fun to use than the melee weapons is the upgraded Tesla gun, the ACAC. Kind of a boring name, but whatever. This thing is a blast. Rapid fire electric blasts that deal no damage to the player? Yeah, I can dig it. But the funds doesn't end it there, guys. Oh no, no, no. No fucking way, bros. You can also use the Sword of Barbarossa on Altar of Blood, and it's just as overpowered and awesome as you would hope. You can unleash a buffed version of the arc attack that the blade had in the Shadow Throne, insta-kill zombies with a standard slash, temporarily paralyze any enemy, barring the Brenner. You can trade your Geistchild slots to create a revive point, get a piece of Geistchild back with a kill similar to the Dancer's Dagger, and hilariously enough, you can actually launch bombers. <laughs> I love this game. I do have a few issues with the maps though, and no, I'm not gonna talk about the unlock method again. I think we've all beat that dead horse into the ground. First off, the way you unlock the battery for the Uber sprang it in Bodega Cervantes. What? All you have to do is play Duck Hunt while a teammate holds a zombie. Well, that's all fine and dandy, 
in, in theory. theory. But what about the solo players? Well, that's where the problem lies. Unless you're willing to waste a shell shock or a lot of jacks, you may as well just give up trying because the round transitions give you next to no time to breathe on these maps. I had this problem with certain parts of the Darkest Shore, the Shattered Throne, and now the Tortured Path. So please, Sledgehammer, if I could only ask for one thing in the next DLC, it'd be to stop punishing solo players. Oh, and add some bat variant. The bomber issue we talked about earlier transitions over to USS Mount Olympus. I have lost so much armor because of how unpredictable bombers are. Okay, this one isn't a problem I myself have, but why can't we play these maps in a public game? I mean, you could play Groston House, why can't you play these ones? I'm personally not even a public match kind of guy. Frankly, I'd rather eat glass. Why are we required to wait until a specific round to pack a punch certain weapons? No, seriously, literally what purpose does this serve? It just feels needlessly restricting. Um, we're also, for the survival maps, reducing, removing the wave count restrictions for wonder weapons. So, uh, Rizzo, we, 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 uh, we got you, buddy. Uh, oh, well then, uh, never mind. This last one isn't really a problem per se. I personally would have liked seeing some different boss zombies make an appearance. Maybe instead of a Brenner every 10 rounds, the game picked from a pool of enemies. Like one round, you could get the normal Brenner, but what if you could get a Meistermoishla instead, or a pack of Sizzler spawned in? Just something to help spice up the game a bit, you know? So, despite them being kinda bare bones, what did I think of the survival maps? Honestly, despite the few issues I have, I love all of them. I honestly didn't think I would, but the fact that each map caters to a different style of play really, really bolsters the DLC. Bodega Cervantes is a lot of fun to just hop in and play for a few minutes. USS Mount Olympus is a lot of fun if you're in for a challenge. And Altar of Blood, like I said, is a nice little mix-up of the two. But let's not beat around the bush. The real attraction of Altar of Blood is being able to use the Sword of Barbarossa without being tied to the 11 round gameplay of the Tortured Path. So, overall, despite a couple design decisions I don't fully agree with, the Tortured Path is something I thoroughly enjoyed. Oh fuck, I'm such a fucking shill. It took a chance and finally shook up the zombies gameplay for the first time since Blundell took the reins back in 2013, yet still has something there for the players who maybe don't enjoy the more objective-oriented stuff. But again, the fact that these survival maps were initially locked behind easter egg completion, which was in itself thought to be locked behind a 4 player public playlist because of poor communication, is genuinely one of the most easily avoidable mistakes I've ever seen in Zombies. In addition to the gameplay, I really enjoyed the character and world building of this DLC. Our bureau operatives finally got a chance to shine and surprisingly, I kinda like Jefferson now. Before this DLC, he was consistently the weak link of the group, both in writing and portrayal. But Beneath the Ice gives us a little bit more insight into who he really is, what made him the way he was, and the playful banter he shares with Drossen is a nice little cherry on top. He's not a top tier zombies character that rivals Primus Richtofen or anything, or Poindexter, but he's certainly improved from the previous entries. But with all that said, The Tortured Path is, without a doubt, a very divisive experience that will push certain players away. Just one of the many things this map has in common with Extinction. Well, that's all for today. If you enjoyed and would like to see more, you can check the description to find a playlist of all my previous long-form reviews. Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a great day.